In this lab, we will learn about tractive effort. And we will begin by defining tractive effort. What is tractive effort? Tractive effort is a force. Well, you might ask yourself, what is a force? From high school physics or any class on classical mechanics, you should know that a force is any interaction that, when unopposed, will change the motion of an object. That is the definition of a force. Or if we want to put it into more mathematical or scientific terms, we can say that a force can cause an object with a certain mass to change its velocity. Now that we know what tractive effort is and what a force is, the question that arises is how do we describe the relationship between a body and the forces that act on it? And the answer to that question can be broadly stated as Newton's laws of motion. Does anyone remember how many laws there are? Well, there are three laws. The first law, also known as the law of inertia, states that objects in motion remain in motion at a constant velocity unless acted upon by a force. And the same goes for objects at rest. The second law states that the vector sum of the forces on an object is equal to the mass of that object multiplied by its acceleration, the well-known F equal MA. So to put it in mathematical terms, the first law is the sum of F is zero, given that the change in speed is zero, and the second law, F equals MA. So let's apply these abstract concepts to our railway scenario. Let's assume that you have a certain rail car that you would like to move, and you are going to apply some force or effort to this rail car. In the picture that you see in front of you, there is an object, our rail car, to which we are going to apply an external force. And of course, that object has a resistance. It could be friction or it could be air resistance, and we'll discuss that in further slides. Now, two main differences in the rail scenario is that first, we are only concerned with longitudinal motion. So it's 1D motion, one dimensional, making it simpler. And the second is that the resistive force is nonlinear. So let's talk a bit about those resistance forces. Imagine you're pushing a car. Why do you think it's very hard to push cars? Why don't they just slide off the road? Well, mainly for something known as rolling resistance. And rolling resistance is a term that encompasses multiple little resistances, such as the rolling friction between the wheels and the rail, and the bearing resistance, which depends on lubrication. So these are the ball bearings that uh, allows your axles and all the rotating parts to rotate uh, easily. Uh, they could be wheel impact against the gauge side of the rail. So as the train maneuvers in corners, so that creates an additional resistance. Plus also air resistance. Remember that air is a fluid and we are moving through that fluid. So definitely there will be air resistance. And last but not definitely not least is grade resistance. And we will see how grade resistance can have a dramatic impact on the tractive effort and the speeds that you can attain. So we just discussed what types of resistances exist, but the question is, how do you measure these resistances? Early measurements simply involved piling weight on at W, as you see in the picture, point W, and determining how much was needed to make the car move. That was the most basic, earliest method of finding out the resistance of a certain rail car. And your outcome, or the result of that experiment, was described as pounds of applied force to move a ton of weight. And that was known as pound force, LBF. And for conversions, one pound force is 0 0.45 kilograms, which is pounds converted to kilograms multiplied by the gravitational acceleration, 9.81 meter per second squared. Now, in this course, we are not really concerned with measuring resistance and more concerned with calculating resistance. 
So now the question is, how do you calculate those resistances, rolling resistance, grade resistance? Well, first, we have to introduce you to the different types of resistances, at least considered in this course. Resistance, symboled R, consists of rolling resistance. And the second one is grade resistance. And the third part is curve resistance, for when the train is going through curves. Rolling resistance is calculated through a simple equation known as the Davis equation, where R is A plus B V plus C V squared, and V is our velocity. Grade resistance is a simple transformation where for each percent of grade, we multiply the mass of the train in tons by 20 pounds. And for curvature, for each one degree of curve, we multiply it by 0 0.8 pounds, which translates to 0.04% of grade. Traditionally, grade resistance and curve resistance are combined in what is known as compensated grade. And the equation for that is compensated grade is grade resistance plus the degree of curvature multiplied by 0.04. Now, what about the other force, tractive effort, the force that helps us overcome the resistance? Tractive effort is the minimum of two different types of tractive efforts. One is the starting tractive effort and the other is the continuous tractive effort. So let's explain that. The starting tractive effort is the tractive effort generated by a locomotive even before it starts moving at very low speeds, before it starts picking up speed. And in that region of operation, the tractive effort is solely dependent on the adhesion coefficient or the friction coefficient and the weight of the locomotive on its axles and is independent of the engine horsepower. Continuous tractive effort, on the other hand, is a function of the engine's horsepower, where it is the multiplication of the horsepower by 375 multiplied by the system efficiency and divided by the velocity of the train. Now, it's important to note down the units used here. Tractive effort is always calculated in pounds, velocity in miles per hour, and, well, power is in horsepower. The 375 is used to convert one horsepower, which is 375 pounds, at one miles per hour. Now, if we want to draw the tractive effort as a function of the velocity of the train, how would that look like? How does the tractive effort vary with velocity? If you remember, tractive effort was the minimum value of two separate types of tractive efforts. The constant type, which is the starting tractive effort, or the maximum tractive effort, is independent of velocity and therefore is drawn as the dashed green line. The dashed white line is the curve that is the reciprocal function relating tractive effort to velocity. If you remember reciprocal functions from calculus. Now, if we take the minimum of the two curves, we end up with the pink curve, which is our tractive effort, showing that at low speeds, the tractive effort is limited by adhesion and not power, while at higher speeds, it's limited by power. If we assume a constant power, the tractive effort goes down as velocity goes up, as you can see from the equation TE equals power divided by velocity. Now, what happens if you increase or decrease that power? Well, increasing or decreasing the power shifts the curve downward or upward. So if you see in the da dashed white line, that's what the tractive effort looks like if you reduce your horsepower. Now, let's bring back the resistances we just talked about into the picture, and let's plot the rolling resistance as a function of the train velocity and let's plot it alongside the tractive effort curve and see if we learn anything. If you can see from the curve where the green line for the resistive force meets the pink line for the tractive effort force, that is a point known as the balance speed. And it's at that speed that both your forward propelling force, your tractive effort, is equal to your resistive forces, and therefore your net forces on the train is zero, making your velocity constant as per Newton's first law.
Here we have a plot of a more realistic tractive effort and resistance curve profiles. And they are more realistic because locomotives don't just have one power level and therefore you'll see that there are several notches, eight in this case, where notch one is your lowest power level and notch eight is your highest power level. We also see two lines representing resistance. The first is only rolling resistance at level grade, so zero grade, and the second is at 1% grade. And we can just notice by simply observing this plot that there is a huge difference in resistance by having a 1% grade only. And the reason for that is the resistance of grade multiplies significantly because these trains are very long and therefore very heavy. In this case, 132 cars, each 113 tons of mass. So and that's why 1% of grade more than doubles your resistance. Now, if you assume that you are driving this train and you are at notch one on level grade, and then you keep on increasing your power, take a look at the black dots on the screen as to how your balance speeds, which is your maximum speed at each power level, increases. Now, what happens if you suddenly hit a higher grade? If you're at notch eight, for example, and you're at level grade, your balance speed is around 60 kilometers per hour or miles per hour, depending on how you calculated it. Now, what happens once you hit that 1% grade? Your balance speed suddenly drops to somewhere between 10 and 20 miles an hour. And that is, these are realistic numbers, and that is meant to give us an understanding of the impact of grade and how tractive effort and resistive forces play out as the train is moving.